In this next section, we will review how neuropsychologists have located memory in the brain. Uh, so we did talk before about the hippocampus being responsible for encoding new long-term memories, so taking that information from short-term memory or working memory and storing it in long-term memory. And we're going to talk about two double dissociations here. Um, so one of the double dissociations involves Henry Molaison, HM is what he was called uh, prior to his death, and he had surgery for epilepsy that required removing uh, a part of his brain. Clive Waring, you can read more about in your textbook, um, but he had encephalitis that resulted in the loss of some of the areas of his uh, lower brain as well. And KF uh, had a brain injury in a motorbike accident. The two that we're going to talk about here, who had uh, short-term memory okay and long-term memory impaired, are HM and Clive Waring. And then KF had short-term memory impaired, while long-term memory was okay. Um, so what this was telling the neuropsychologists looking at this was that HM and Clive Waring, who had damage uh, to certain areas of the brain, uh, were able to work uh, on, have working memory and be able to use their short-term memory, but they could not encode memories in long-term memory or recall in HM's case. So the main takeaway here is that uh, short-term memory and long-term memory are represented by different areas of the brain. We also are going to learn about two different types of long-term memory, episodic, which is memory for personal events, and semantic, which means meaning, so facts and knowledge that are more general world knowledge. So episodic memory involves um, essentially mental time travel, so you are taking yourself back to a certain place and time, and there is no guarantee of accuracy, which means that when you consider things like eyewitness testimony, um, or just in general you are describing events that occur uh, in the past, they may not be accurate because you are potentially confounding them with other areas of your memory. Um, semantic memory does not involve that time travel, if you will. It is about general facts and knowledge about the world in which you live. Because of that, episodic and semantic memory show a double dissociation as well. And again, we look to neuropsychology to give some evidence of that. Uh, so one patient, KC, had a damaged hippocampus, and KC uh, did not have access to episodic memory, so could not relive any events, could not uh, recall specific points in time, but semantic memory was intact, so he was able to recall uh, certain facts about the world, like, for example, um, what names of objects were, and things like that. On the other hand, there was an Italian woman who um, we don't have information on per se, uh, who had impaired semantic memory and could not remember general world knowledge, but could use episodic memory to describe the past events. And this is what this double dissociation looks like here. So again, we know that semantic memory and episodic memory are likely housed in two different areas of the brain. We also have support from brain imaging experiments. So looking at um, MRI and fMRI tells us a little bit more about um, episodic and semantic memory. They do activate different areas of the brain. What we also know is that episodic memory can be lost, leaving only semantic memory. Um, so you might have specific information that is episodic uh, and is tied to certain events, but you might still remember the meaning. Um, for example, if you think of a, a birthday, you might think about your fifth birthday party and not be able to recall the uh, specific event, but you know what a birthday cake 
signifies or blowing out the candles, for example. Um, and on the flip side, and I talked about this a little bit with my uh, master's thesis on semantic dementia, semantic memory can be enhanced if it's associated with episodic memory. And there are a few different types of episodic memory. So one is autobiographical memory. You are thinking of your own personal experiences. Um, and then also personal semantic memories, uh, things that have personal significance to you. Like, uh, I remember uh, my first car was a Chevy, uh, and other people may not know as much about Chevrolets because they don't have that significance. Um, and that can experience, uh, I'm sorry, that can influence what we experience by determining what we attend to.